All right, let's go to Gainesville, Florida, and talk to Jackie. What's up, Jackie? Hi, John. How are you? Good. What are you doing? Not much. Just sitting on my lunch break. Your lunch break? Oh, I guess we're, I got some hours differences. Yeah, just one hour. Very cool. All right, so what's up? So my question for you is, how do you move on from toxic family members that you've cut out of your life? Um, I have this issue where I have cut out my dad for being very toxic, and um, it's been over a year, but I still find myself going on Facebook and looking through like my grandma's profile, his mom, to see what he's up to. Mm -hmm. I find myself looking at the settings on my phone because you can see your blocked messages and I'll look be like, has he contacted me? Mm -hmm. And so I've done some self-reflection about it and I think I've gotten to the point where I feel like I need to be validated in my decision to do that. Um, but I don't think that's the right way to find that validation. And I don't know if you would be able to help me out with that. Yeah, I think I can. Um, and thank you for sharing that. That's, you are not alone, Sister Jackie. There, you, that's such a common response to the hard, brave thing you did, which is to set down boundaries. What happened? Like there was some moment when you said enough is enough. You've been dealing with this your whole life and it escalated. What happened? Why'd you finally say no more? I got pregnant with my first. Okay. And, um, so we live in different strict, different states and most of our communications through text. Um, when I was growing up, I watched him be, um, sort of abusive towards my ex stepmom, and, uh, he was emotionally abusive, manipulative. And, um, so I went through all that and I see him, he's kind of like my bear, like he, I, I'm uncomfortable around him, talking to him and stuff. Mm, okay. And as I got older and started a family of my own, um, I realized like the negativity that he brings into my life was just too much. And when I was pregnant, I realized it kind of escalated. And um, then I got pregnant with my second and I just realized he's not the type of person I wanted around my kids mm -hmm. if I'm so uncomfortable around him. Absolutely. Or and you, so, you, oh, sorry. Did, so did a thing finally happen? Did he say the wrong thing? Did he swear at you? Or did he make a comment about your husband? Like what happened? So um, we would text back and forth all the time. Um, well, not all the time. It'd be like months in between. Mm -hmm. But every time we would text he eventually would get to the point like, I wish we were better. I wish you would get over what happened in the past. And I would tell him, um, I'm sorry. That's something that I'm working on. I'm in therapy. And um, he would blame me for not contacting him more. Mm -hmm. And he would even blame my mom, which he divorced 20 years ago, that she like um, put me against him and everything, yet he's the one that would badmouth my mom while I was growing up and so, still does. So let me tell you this. Your, your, your dad is a child. Yeah. And your dad's yeah. a coward. And he cares more about his, him propping up his own ego to himself than he does about his relationship with his daughter and his new grandkids. And those are things you have felt for a long, long time. Probably no one's ever said them like that. And I know it's hard to hear, but it's the truth. And if you don't hear that, you're going to continue to think you're crazy for protecting yourself and your little kids and you're not. Because mm -hmm. that man's going to use you and now he's going to use your grandkids 
to prop up his own ego like he's tried to do for so long. You know what, what matters 20 years ago? Not a lot. I'm way more concerned that he hasn't gotten in his car and driven to your house and knocked on your door with tears in his eyes and said, I'm so sorry, I'm your dad. And more so than any of my stupid arguments or blaming you, I should have shown up and been your dad and I wasn't, I'm sorry. And he doesn't do that. He launches text grenades at you every once in a while and they burrow into your heart and then you feel crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So what you did was the right thing. And I wanna, just for all the people listening, you did something um, that was so wise. Um, and I want to just call it out. You don't like who you become when you're around him. And often that impacts our children more so than any dumb comment or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They know that walking into this house mom begins to feel like X or act like X or she becomes Y. And then these kids get unmoored by that. And so you saying, I don't like who I become around you. I'm stepping out of this thing. Good for you. I'm proud of you, Jackie. It's hard what you did and I'm proud of you. Now here's the next part. I could, I could ask you this question, but we'll just cut to the chase. You spend a lifetime being told that what you believe is not trustworthy. What you feel is not trustworthy. Oh, isn't that the truth? Okay. Especially by him. There you go. So it makes 100% sense that you finally acted and you don't trust yourself. That you did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So recognizing that is part one. Part two is acting differently now. Okay. So I don't want to overthink this. Get off social media. Or block your grandmother too. And start having human to human conversations. Make it to where you, there was a season when I was out of control with my spending. I was just a maniac, man. We finally make, I was finally getting a real paycheck for the first time in my life. And I was just bonkers. And at some point I took my debit card out of my wallet and gave it to my wife. I, I, I had that little self-control and I had to show up to a few places where I'd already eaten and I realized afterwards I didn't have my, you know what I mean? Cause it was just, a, I had learned the hard way, but that's what, that was how drastic I got. I think that's where you are because here's what you have to do. You have to practice trusting yourself and you've never done that before. And your kids need you to do that. Your husband needs you to do that. You need to do that. But if you've got that prop, that crutch to fall back on, to see, is he screwing something up? Is he being a knucklehead? Is he still with that woman? Whatever the, the thing is that you keep going back, um, you're going to keep doing it. You got to practice. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah. Let me ask you this. Um, well, I'll, I'll just say it this way. Brene Brown calls it rehearsing tragedy. Do you sit, uh, and I love that. It's just a dress rehearsal for, for a tragedy. How, how often do you sit and just have imaginary conversations with this guy? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> how often do you have imaginary conversations with your mom? Like she's finally going to just ask you that one right question and you're going to unload. Or you're great. Never. Gra Never. <laughs> she's like my best friend. She already knows everything. Okay, she already does. So <sighs> rumination, just spinning out, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. That feels like good, helpful thinking. It feels like there's a potential threat down the road and we're going to think through how we're going to respond ahead of time. The idea of it mm -hmm. sounds good. Hear me say this as, as boldly as I can. Rumination and worry is a complete and utter waste of your time. In fact, it steals from your children. It steals from your partner. It steals from you. Because it takes you from the present and it spins your body up. Your body actually goes to war for you. It actually, it's, it's like, oh, there's not even a bear here. Um, but we can conjure one up in our brains and then we can respond to it. And it does. you see what I'm saying? And you get out of the shower and you've been sitting in there having these imaginary conversations in the shower. For some reason, I hear all over the country, people have these in the shower. I think usually that's finally when people get still enough in a day 
where they can just, and that water's relaxing a little bit and then they can, the machine just kicks up, right? Me, me too. <laughs> so listen, <laughs> Jackie, I wish it was more complicated than this. Quit. Quit. Stop having an imaginary conversations with your dad that you are never going to have in real life. As my friend Todd says, he doesn't have a meteorite plan. So if a meteorite comes, we will, he will deal with the economic fallout of that when it happens. And I'll tell you, your dad's probably not going to knock on your door and say, I'm so sorry. Do you forgive me? He's probably not. And so feel free to deal with that if it ever happens. It probably won't. And stop giving him rent-free space in the middle of your chest. Stop giving him rent-free space in the middle of your marriage, in the middle of your parent, of your kids, in the middle of your of your heart and head. Is that fair? Yeah, it is. You're entering into the holiday season, right? We're going to get into October, November, December. This is going to be extra hard, is it? Yeah, especially if I'm thinking about visiting the family in that state. Don't. Why would you do that? Because I love everybody else. Do you get anxious when you're around them? Mainly him. Okay. If he's there, don't go. Okay. Because then you're just, uh, you know what I mean? You're trying to have your cake and eat it too. You drew a boundary. Maybe at some point you let them know, I've chosen to not be around him because he's gaslighting and manipulative and abusive and he still won't take any ownership of the way he treated me and my family. Um, and if y'all choose to invite him, then then y'all are choosing for us to not come and that's totally cool. You can do that. You can put the ball in their court. But I don't see anything wrong with you taking a year off and just deciding, opting for solving for peace this holiday season. And that means you're gonna have to grieve it and you're gonna be sad. You're gonna miss out on all the this and the that. And you can't just do nothing. You got to backfill it with, then we're going to go here. We're going to go do this thing or we're going to go try this thing, but do something else. Give your heart and mind and soul and home a rest. Is that possible? Okay. Yeah, it is. Does that sound like, ah, uh, or like, what are you feeling when I'm saying this? It does sound like, ah. <laughs> um, it sounds it like, ah, like scared or ah, uh, like peaceful. <laughs> I guess that wasn't really <laughs> um, specific, but uh, it, peaceful, definitely peaceful. Oh, dude, solve for solve for freedom, solve for peace, solve for sleep, which you probably don't have enough of with two little ones, right? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> what about just having a peaceful holiday season? And all you have to do is just send an email to your family that says, hey, we're not traveling this this year. I have a very different situation with my family. Like, I love my family. I like hanging out with them. Um, and I sent the email yesterday to all of them that said, I let myself get out of control last fall with all of my travel. And I had a book deadline due. It just got chaotic. And then hosting the holidays, I became someone I don't like. I didn't like. I wasn't the dad I wanted to be, the family member, the friend, the husband. I wasn't, I wasn't the guy I wanted to be. So this year we're not hosting. And so I'm letting y'all know way up, way in advance, three or four months. Y'all don't need to buy plane tickets and come out here. We're not going to do a big old thing. Um, we're going to come to your house on this day. If y'all can make it great. If, if you don't, if that's not a good time for y'all, we won't come. But we just decided, or I decided, man, I need, I need to recalibrate. I need peace. And then I'm going to figure out how I can best honor my family on the back end of that. See what I'm saying? So maybe this year you write your family letters, tell them you love them and you miss them and wish them well and send them a note that says we're not going to travel this year and then just, whoo, relax, right? Right. Does that sound good? It does. It's, I guess um, it can be a little heartbreaking not being able to see everybody else. And do you get that a heartbreak is okay? Um, I guess, yeah. It's not fun. It's not pleasant, but it's right. Like, I, it makes mm -hmm. sense that you're heartbroken. Most of the time when somebody puts up, we put up a boundary with somebody who's um, blown up our lives. We don't recognize the impact of that boundary and still until people start banging their head up against it.
And what I mean by that is we like, we think that we can put up a boundary around one person, one friend, one community member, one husband or ex-wife or one, you know, somebody struggling with addiction, whatever that is. Um, but we don't realize that you can't – very rarely can you put up a boundary around somebody in isolation. It usually impacts an entire system and your body's going to have to get used to the fact that your dad blew up everything. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. And blaming him and sitting there wallowing in that and getting mad at it, that doesn't solve any of your issues. What solves your issues is saying, cool, I'm not going to be around that. I'm not going to have my kids around that. I'm going to create something new and that's annoying and hard and I don't want to, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something new and I'm going to solve for freedom. Not like freedom, not like political, not I'm going to solve for peace. I'm going to solve for sleep. I'm going to solve for rest. I'm going to solve for laughter. I'm going to solve for kindness and patience. I'm going to solve for whoo. Yeah, we could all use a little bit more of that. Thanks for the call, Jackie.